نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل اقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من احلی اللہم فکه ناپ الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم الہم نرشتن و عزن من شرور انفسنا اللہم انی اسألکا حبکا و حب من یحبکا و عمل اللذی یبلغنی حبکا اللہم ارن الحق حقا و رزقن اتباعا اللہم ارن الباطل باطلا و رزقن اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ سورة النساء ورس 131 وللہ ما فی السماوات و ما فی الارض and to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and we have instructed those who were given the scriptures before you and yourselves to fear Allah. But if you disbelieve, then to Allah belongs whatever is in the heaven and whatever is on the earth. And ever is Allah free of need and is praiseworthy. Verse 132 وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and sufficient is Allah as disposer of affairs. In these two verses 131 and 132 Thrice has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeated these words لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ That is what to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Not only in these two verses has this been repeated thrice but this has been this part of the verse has been repeated so many times in Quran. So, I would here want to mention a few behaviors and a few things. We, whenever we come across these words, we need to revise and we need to uh, have a state of mind regarding those things and those behaviors we need to remember. <coughs> The various points which we are always going to think when we come across these words in the verses of Allah, the first thing being that this verse provides the proof of the oneness of Allah, that there is only one sovereign authority in the universe. He is the sole creator, the sole sustainer, the sole power, the sole controller, the sole master, the sole ruler and for him is everything in the universe that is on the earth and that is in the heavens. So this verse proves the oneness of Allah. The second thing which we need to always remember whenever we go across these words in any verse is that this verse provides the proof of the power of Almighty Allah over its beings, over its creatures and over the, all the things in this immense and huge universe. So it makes us feel how insignificant and how weak we are in front of this almighty power of Allah and this will thus produce or create a state of humbleness in all the beings of Allah. <coughs> the third thing which the verse teaches us is that how important and how obligatory it is to be obedient to Allah, to submit 
and to surrender to the obedience of Allah is a very important message of this verse. Because from here we realize that everything on the earth and everything in the heavens and the whole of the creations in the universe, they submit, they surrender and they are obedient to Almighty Allah. So we being the superior beings, we also need to completely submit and totally surrender and become obedient beings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth point, which we always need to remember when we come across these words in the verses is that when all the things in the land, in the earth or in the heavens and all the creations of the universe are his, they belong to him. He is the master of everything. He is the creator, the sustainer, the owner, the master, the ruler of everything. So all the things actually belong to him. All the things in the universe actually belong to the actual master. Then the things which we think are ours, our houses, our cars, our jewelries, our all the things which we have been gifted and we think that they are ours are actually also whose? They are actually Allah Almighty's things. He has just handed them over to us for this temporary lifespan. So when we realize that all our personal belongings are not even our own, they are actually the possessions of Allah and he has out of his possessions handed us over a few of his possessions to use temporarily in our worldly life. So what do we need to do when we think of that? We need to praise him. We need to praise him saying Alhamdulillah and we need to remember him. Remembrance of Allah and then we need to be thankful to him, to be grateful to him. Gratitude of Allah is what we need to learn from this part of the verse. And then another thing is, then when all the things we have are actually not our own, then we have no reason to be proud or to arrogant or to be just arrogant about or to go off showing or flaunting about our worldly possessions because they are not actually our. You know that if you see a person who has who has borrowed a thing like a jewelry or a car from some of some of his or her friends. Now a person who's borrowed something for temporary usage, does that person get arrogant on the borrowed thing? Or does that person go about boasting and flaunting and showing about? No, because the person knows that it is not actually his own. So similarly, we need not be arrogant about any of our worldly wealth, any of our worldly riches, of our huge colossal properties, because they are not actually our own. They are actually the property and possession of the real master, Almighty Allah. So this verse takes out all forms of arrogance and instills and injects the feeling of humbleness in all of us. And it takes out of our manners all forms and behaviors of showing off and boasting and flaunting about our personal possessions. Then and other things. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away any of the blessings which He has which He has blessed us with, and He does this as a trial for all of us, then what do we need to do? He gave us a few blessings, He blessed us with His bounties, and then it took and then he took back a few or just one. Then how do we need to behave? We need to be patient. We need to be contented in his decisions. 
Because, you know, you see, if in this world we borrow something, we borrow a dress or we borrow a jewelry from one of my friends, I borrow something. And after some time, my friend asks for it and she asks me to return it back. What would I do? Would I start shouting and yelling and yelling and crying and howling? Obviously, no, because I know it was not mine. I just had, I had just borrowed it for some time. So when she's asking it back or when she's wanting it back or when she takes it back, I won't cry and I won't yell and shout or howl my head off. So this is exactly what we need to realize. That Allah, Allah when gives us some of his blessings as a trial, and when he takes back some of his blessings as a trial, we need to know Lillahi ma fil samawati wa ma fil ard. And we need to stay patient. And we need to be contented and peaceful and calm regarding the decision Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for our life. And then Another thing which we all need to educate ourselves after going through these words of the words is that when all the possession, personal possessions we have are actually not our own, they are Allah's, then how are we supposed to use them? How are we supposed to use them in our lives? With our own will? With our own wishes? According to our desires? No! Obviously, no. Like, I'll give you an example to understand. For example, if you or I, we were living in a rental house, was it possible that we will be able to add windows, break the walls and add doors the way we would want to and the way the place we would want to? Obviously, no. We will just have to live in the rental house according to the wishes and the regulations of the actual landlord, the actual owner. So these houses are worldly houses, which we sometimes assume that they are our because on a piece of paper, they have been entitled to us. They have been transferred on our names. And we think that they are our homes. But remember, these, these homes, these houses, which we believe and assume are ours, when death, when death is going to attend any one of us, on the day we're going to depart, we're going to, we are going to leave these houses as quickly and as empty-handed that we just can't imagine that even a tenant living in the house of a landlord doesn't walk off that quickly and that empty-handed. Empty even, a, even a tenant takes out his possessions and takes some, some time to go out or leave the house. So we're going to pass, leave the house as quickly and as empty-handed out of our houses as a tenant doesn't even pass out or move out of his rental house. So these are not actually our own. So how we are going to decorate them, how we are going to arrange gatherings and parties, whether we're going to have mixed gatherings, whether we're going to have musical nights, whatever forms of parties and get togethers or decorations we're going to have in our houses, will be not according to our wishes or our desires, but it will be according to the do's and don'ts and limits of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is what this part of the verse is going to clearly remind us of whenever we come across this verse in the verses of Quran. So the verse is going to teach us and introduce us the concept of monotheism, that is the oneness of Allah, and the concept of totally surrendering and submitting and obeying the orders of Allah to leave all forms of arrogance and 
to adopt humbleness, the remembrance of Allah, the gratitude of Allah, and then to completely surrender to Him in completely obedience to Him who is the master of masters and who is the master of the universe. Rabbana innana amanna Rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana zunubana wa qina azab an-nar Rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana zunubana wa kaffir anna sayyiatina wa tawaffana ma'al abrar Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin Verse 133 And if he wills he can do away with you O people and bring others in your place and ever is Allah competent to do that Verse 134 Man kana yuridu thawab ad-dunya fa inna Allah sawab ad-dunya wal akhirah wa kana Allah sami'an basira and whoever desires the reward of this world then with allah is the reward of this world and hereafter and ever is allah hearing and seeing the verse 134 <coughs> the verse 134 is actually now explaining about the importance of intentions the importance of intentions behind a deed and the whole concept would be more clear if i narrate the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said innama al-a'malu binniyat deeds depend upon intentions every person professor has further said that every person will get a reward according to his intentions one who migrated for the worldly gains will get reward in this world only that is there will be no reward for his hereafter for example one who migrated to marry a woman will get his woman only so the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are very clear and clearly elaborating the actual message of the verse 134 what does this actually mean that deeds depend upon intentions is that that when a person does something for the worldly gains the desire or the intention and the purpose the person is doing some deed or some activity or an action is totally for the worldly gains his intention may be to please or to impress people around him or he might be wanting to work to have fame and popularity in his circle around him or to have or develop a good reputation in the world in the society or his intention or desire for doing was to make him more successful in the world the goal or the target or the aim was the worldly gains and the worldly riches so under all these conditions when the intention is the worldly success or the worldly riches or the worldly reputation or the worldly popularity the target of his work out and his struggle is just the world then what we are learning from here is that he might just manage to achieve the worldly success he might just be able to get successful and he might be able to achieve for what he was striving and struggling for in the worldly cause but in the whole process he will be deprived of any reward for the world for the world hereafter he will only achieve and acquire what he wanted in the world but for the hereafter for all the activities and for all his deeds he will not be rewarded in hereafter and on the contrary totally contrary contrary to that that if a person does something for with the intention of hereafter 
the intention of hereafter will be like what that is he the basic purpose of doing something was that he wants to seek pleasure of allah he wants to please allah or he wants to save himself from the wrath of allah from the punishment of allah or to save himself from the hell or the purpose of doing or the intention of doing a deed is solely and solely to enter into jannah then only will he be rewarded in hereafter if he does any deed or any activity in this life with any of these intentions or any of these purposes in mind then only will he be rewarded in hereafter but you know what actually happens is that when a person works and struggles and strives for the cause of hereafter he actually manages to get the worldly success as well as that and the reward of hereafter as well but the person who works just for the world he may or he may not get the world he may not or he may get his achievement or success but in any case he will not achieve the reward of hereafter as allah says la khalaqa lahum fil akhirah there will be no share there will be no portion in akhirah or hereafter for people who are struggling and striving and working day to night morning till evening they're working for the worldly issues la khalaqa lahum fil akhirah there will be no share there will be no part for them in the akhirah as allah says in surah al-baqarah wa min an-nas man yaqulu rabbana atina fi dunya hasana ma lahu fil akhirati min khalaq فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا قَسَبُوا وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ Allah says that among people is he who says O oh my sustainer grant us good in this world about him allah says what there is no share of reward for him in hereafter but among them are those who pray o oh, our sustainer give us good in this world and good of the world hereafter these are the people these are the people they are praying for what they are praying for this world and they are praying for both the hereafter us as well allah commands these are the people who will receive the share of what they have earned in hereafter so this is the actual concept of intentions being rewarded for wherever they are targeted and they have been they have been targeted to achieve i would make um, i will narrate another incident in the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to make the whole situation more clear In Bukhari it is reported that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam visited one of his companions and there in his house he saw a ventilator and he asked the companion why he had left this ventilator and why he had kept this ventilator in the room and the companion answered that he had planned to leave this ventilator just because he wanted that light and air should enter the room and his room be bright and airy and fresh Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Oh my brother, if while making this ventilator, you had kept the intention that the sound of the proclamation of salah, that is the sound of azan, will come to you through it, then making of this ventilator would have been a source of continuous reward for you. And as for the light and the air, it would have come in in any case." So this is the matter of intentions. Whatever we do in this world, whatever good deeds we are going to do in this world, we we need not desire an intent in our hearts for this worldly success or achievement always intent for hereafter. Because for the deeds of the believers to be accepted on the day of resurrection and for the believers to be rewarded for their deeds on the day of judgment 
the deeds have to be associated in three forms number one there has to be belief and faith a perfect and a complete belief and faith without this any good deed will not be effected will not be accepted the second thing is that these have to be righteous deeds and righteous deeds are what which come up to the up to the level of quran and the teachings of hadith and sunnah so the second thing is that a person who believes and his deeds are not up to the mark of quran and hadith then these are not righteous deeds just just belief will not be a source of salvation so the first thing which is needed for salvation or for the acceptance and for the rewards of these on the day of judgment number 1 is belief and faith and number 2 is that the deeds should be righteous deeds and the third and the most important thing which we have learned today from this verse 134 of surah an-nisa is that the intentions for the deeds should be for hereafter for the player of allah then only will be the deed accepted as a good deed on the day of judgment and the person be rewarded for it as jannah <coughs> now we need to understand that why has allah taught us this concept like this that only those deeds which are for intention for hereafter will be accepted why What difference does it make to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala what intentions we make? Number 1, it is it has been made so to maintain the purity of thoughts and the mind and the soul of the believer will remain pure, clear-headed about the goal, about the targets in his life and about his final destination as Jannah. There will be no confusion, the person will not be double-minded. and not doubtful about any aims or goals or targets or ambitions in the world the final destination would be definitely jannah the second cause is why it has been made so these are a few logics which i can understand otherwise we obviously we all need to understand that whatever allah orders has definitely hikmat and logic in it we might not be able to comprehend it but allah is al hakim and all his orders are full of logic and full of hikmat <coughs> so the second thing is to save the people from from worrying from the stresses from the anxieties and from failures this is how that is when a person works hard the person struggles and strives for some worldly cause or target he is not sure to achieve his target or aim he might or he might not so you know what happens when the person faces failure and when the person is not successful he works hard he struggles he strives and despite all his hard work and efforts he does he fails to achieve and he is not successful and he is a failure so after prolonged struggle if a person fails to achieve something what happens is then stress comes up there will be anxiety there will be depression the person will get hopeless and there might be things like nervous breakdowns ending up in his life and once he loses hope then he will stop struggling he will stop struggling he will stop working hard any longer there will be no steadfastness and perseverance in his activity and then this again will lead to further failures and failures in his life on the contrary when the target is just the player of allah when the goal is just the destination of jannah then after struggling if there is a failure in the worldly achievements it will have no it will have no implications there will be no repercussions there will be no tension there will be no anxiety there will be no depression there will be no upsetting because the purpose was to please allah and allah is all knowing 
and he knows, he sees, he hears what the person has done and he will be rewarded. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us concern and relate our intentions not for the world but for hereafter. I will make you understand all this by a day-to-day -day life example. Like you see, if there is a girl who gets married and after her marriage, she tries days in and out to work, to please her husband or her in-laws. She works day in and out. And her basic goal is that her husband gets pleased with her and her husband is happy with her or her in-laws are happy with her. But what happens is that despite of all her sincere efforts, neither her hus husband appreciate nor does her in-laws acknowledge. She keeps on working, but none of them is acknowledging and none of them is appreciating and it is not affecting anybody. So what would the result be? How would she feel? Put yourself in her shoes. How would she feel? She would be depressed. She would be disappointed. She would feel hopeless. And you can very clearly relate that for two months, three months, or max six months, and then she will be exhausted. She will be frustrated. She will be depressed. And she will leave all efforts which she was doing. But on the contrary, if behind all the efforts she was doing, the intentions were just to seek the pleasure of Allah, she was just, she had the intention of serving her husband. Her intention in serving her husband was that she was considering this as her religious obligation. And she was considering that, that it is the duty of a Muslim a Muslim wife as imposed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or she was looking after or being kind to her in-laws to obey or to please Allah. The purpose was not to seek the pleasure of her husband. The purpose was not to seek the pleasure of the in-laws, but the purpose was to obey and to please Allah. Even if they are not happy with her, even if they don't acknowledge, she would still know she would stay content despite the failure to please the husband or to failure to please her in-laws. She would know that Allah Almighty, she would know, has been watching throughout, has been hearing everything and has been recording and putting in everything. And he will no doubt reward her in the day of judgment. So no hopelessness, no helpless feeling, no depression, no anxiety, and most of all, persistence, perseverance of action. And you know, because of this perseverance in action and his her persistent efforts, what will happen ill in the end will be that formula, as they say, Slow and steady wins the race. So she kept on doing it perseverantly and because of her perseverant action, she will ultimately finally succeed in winning over the heart of those in the world and at the same time gaining benefits and rewards and success of hereafter. I hope I could make the whole concept clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us develop the desire and the intentions of hereafter and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our deeds and bless us with the maximum of reward for all our deeds however tiny and however small or insignificant they are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us help us steadfastness help us perseverance in our good deeds and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when we are in your court, bless us with your pleasure, bless us with easy accountability and bless us with the forgiveness of our sins and bless us the permission to enter into Jannah. Rabbi wa anta khayru rahimeen. 
Allahumma innaka afuwan karimun tuhibbul affa fa'fu anna fa'fu anna fa'fu anna Verse 135 Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu kunu qawwa mina bil qisti Shuhada alillahi walau ala anfusikum awil walidaini wal aqarabin O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even it be against yourselves or your parents and relatives, whether one is rich or poor, Allah is most worthy of both. So follow not personal inclinations, lest you not be just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed Allah is ever with what you do acquainted. In verse 135, Allah is ordering all of us, all the believers to be just and not just to be just in their personal lives, but to stand up. to get up to stand up for justice to raise your voices for justice to help establish justice and to be steadfast in establishing justice and for all forms of justice at all levels so justice is the order here in this verse how important being just and fair is verse 90 of surah an-nahl allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted three important do's of allah as we know that all the verses of quran are the commandments and the orders of allah and they are the do's and don'ts of allah But in the verse 90 of Surah An-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> in verse 90 of Surah An-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted His three very special commandments, His three very highlighted do's. And what are they? Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْمُرُ بِالْأَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى the three do's and three prominent highlighted commandments of allah there is absolutely no doubt that allah orders you allah commands you for what the first thing is justice the first thing is justice the second is goodness and the third is giving and spending on your relations of kin So the first and the primary commandment of Allah in this verse is adl justice equality fairness fair dealings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 8 of surah al-maida says i'dilu huwa aqrabu lit-taqwa be just this is close to being god fearing So people who are God fearing they need to be just and they need to be fair in their dealings. Similarly Allah says inna allaha yuhibbul muqsidin there is absolutely no doubt for sure that Allah loves all those who are just and who are fair. Allahumma ja'alna minhum o Allah make us one of them. An attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal himself is that he is al-adil. He is just. In Surah Al-A'raf verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَ عِزِنِّ الْحَقِّ That on the day of judgment, there will be such an extensive justice and fairness in all forms of dealings that Allah says, true and just will be the weight of that day allah says la yuzlimuna fatila and allah says fa amma man saqalat mawazinuhu 
فهو في عيشة راضية فأما من خفت موازينه فأمه حافية How light are the scales going to be? How sensitive are the scales weighing the deeds would be? As Quran and as the words of the Prophet Sallallahu said that they will be able to detect the difference of weight equal to the seed of mustard and they will be able to detect the difference of weight equal to the nets, the weight of the nets. So this is all because Allah is just and Allah will be fair on the day of resurrection. All the messengers of Allah were just and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just. Justice is what we find in the model of excellence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So many events like we we learn of an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that there was a fight, there was an issue between uh, a paternal cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a Jew and it was regarding the issue of uh, watering of the fields and the Jew was on the right stance and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's paternal cousin was being unfair and the issue was brought to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for decision and he hearing the whole situation he decided against his own cousin and in favor of the Jew. <coughs> this is what? This is a model of fairness. This is a model of justice by the Prophet ﷺ. Then the story which I just narrated a few days back regarding that hypocrite who was, um, who was uh, belonging to Banu Zafar and when he was uh, he was blamed of stealing, then all his clan came over and they were blaming the Jew for the theft. But when the verses were revealed, Allah wanted justice. Allah wanted a fair decision. And the verses were revealed for justice and the verses were revealed so that there was no unfair decision. And when the verses were revealed, Prophet Wasallam gave the decision of punishment not for the Jew, but for whom? For the hypocrite. Then there was another incident in the life of Prophet Wasallam. It has been reported that there was a lady who belonged to the family of chiefs. And uh, it was a tribe of uh, Banu Makhdum that she belonged to. And she also stole something. And when the proceeding was brought to Prophet Wasallam for hearing and for decision and for the judgment, he was in the proceeding and he was about to decide or announce punishment for her that Hazrat Osama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala and who he came interceding for this lady of Banu Makhtum who was Hazrat Osama bin uh, Zayd he was the son of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's adopted son, Hazrat Zayd bin Haris Raziallahu Ta'ala Anhu. And so he was actually uh, a sort of a grandson, adopted grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he has been given the title of the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How dear he was to him. Very frequently, he used to make him sit in his lap. And when Hazrat Osama bin Zayd sitting in his lap on his thighs, he used to gently stroke his head, his hair, and he used to smell and he used to kiss his hair. And then he used to raise his hands. And Prophet used to say, Oh Allah, I love him. You love him too. So he used to pray for him getting as the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Hazrat Osama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala and who, who at this point in the proceeding of the whole case of that Makhdoumi lady, he came interceding and pleading for that lady. Prophet sallallahu was so furious that his face went red. The transmitters say that his face went, he was red. He got up, he stood up and he said, 
Don't you start following the doings of the followers of the previous prophets or the messengers. Don't you start following the footsteps of the people before you. They used to give punishments to the lower class of the society and they used to waver off the punishments from the upper class of the society. By Allah, a justly implemented law of Allah will be more useful for the community than the continuous reigning for 40 days. And then Prophet Sallallahu said these remarkable words. Prophet Sallallahu said, By Allah, if Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha, daughter of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, commits theft, then I would order that her hands be cut off also. So this was the model of justice in the model of excellence of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the model of equality, of justice, and of fair dealings and fair decisions. And not only the Prophet Wasallam, even his companions, growing through all these verses of Quran, ordering justice, and relating to the words of Prophet Wasallam, and seeing and observing the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, the companions were also just. Like Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his justice is precedented. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was, he was the caliph and his son was found guilty of drinking, of drinking alcohol and the judge assigned the punishment of whipping. And in Hazrat Umar's period, it was the rule that the first few whips would be struck by the judge imposing the punishment himself. This was to instruct the person who is going to whip after, after that. But the first few times it was done initially by the judge who had imposed the punishment. Now, on the day when the punishment was being, would have to be uh, conducted, I've mentioned many times that all the punishments in an Islamic state are to be conducted publicly. So Hazrat Umar ta'ala who was also there to witness the uh, prosecution, the judge started striking. But out of courtesy for Hazrat Umar ta'ala anhu, out of the courtesy of his presence, he was he was just whipping slightly gently. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, on observing this, he was furious. He was furious to see this injustice being done to his son. He got up and he snatched the whip from the judge's hand and then he started whipping. He started whipping himself on the naked back of his son. And he was saying, he was asking and he was telling his son that, oh, my son, when on the day of resurrection, you are presented before the court of Allah Almighty, then bear witness, then bear witness that my father used to implement the laws of Allah as a just ruler. This was the justice and the intention and the triggering force behind this justice was what? The fear of Allah the fear of hereafter, the fear of accountability of Allah and the fear of punishment of Allah. As Prophet ﷺ in a hadith reported and narrated in Bukhari, Prophet ﷺ said, I've been narrating these words even previously, but it is a very, very important information. We keep on relating this. Prophet ﷺ said that there will be no shade on the day of resurrection except the shade of the throne of Allah Almighty. And seven people will be permitted and allowed in the shade of the throne of Allah. The first person in the list, the first person in the list will be whom? A just ruler. A ruler who in his, who in the period of his government used to 
do all the decisions and who used to implement things in a fair manner with total equality of all their beings and in total justice would be the first person who will be admitted into the shade of throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, justice is an order of Allah. Justice and fairness in dealings is obligatory for all the believers. And justice is mandatory for peace. You see, Allah is Al-Adil, Allah is just. So that is why we can see that there is peace and there is harmony in the universe because Allah Azzawajal is just. And since He is just, there is peace in His universe. When there is prevalence of justice at any level, only will there be prevalence of peace at that level. So, there will be peace for peace and harmony in our lives, in our homes, in our society, in our state. Justice is needed. There will be peace in the state. There will be peace in an Islamic state if the just laws of Quran are implemented with full justice and fairness. So we need we need justice at all levels. Justice at the level of state to keep the state in a state of peace. Then the justice at the social level. That, it, that is at all levels of the society there has to be justice. Like as far as admissions, admissions in the schools, admissions in colleges, admissions in universities, has to be on merit, has to be on a just and a fair and a correct merit. Selections for jobs, interviews for appointments, the decisions have to be made fairly and just manner. Promotions, postings, so everywhere, everywhere, at all occasions, at all places, with everyone, everywhere, in everything, in every issue, in every matter, in every decision, will there be total justice, total fairness, and total equality. No false intercessions, unfair, undue, unjust, or biased decisions or dealings will lead to frustration in the society. We lead to frustration of the qualified and the deserving and meritorious individuals. And then these people who were qualified and deserving when they will be deprived of their just and fair rights, they may out of sheer frustration turn out to be delinquents of the society. They may convert into the delinquents of the society, causing unrest and causing lack of justice in the society. So we need to have justice at the state level and we need to establish justice at the social level. And last but not the least, we need to have total justice at the domestic level also. And this is mandatory. This is what we all need to understand from the core of our heart that we in our domestic dealings all forms of domestic dealings and domestic relationships, we need to be fair and we need to be just. Like I would now be talking about a list of situations and relations which we need to be, actually we need to be just. We need to be just among our children, the sons and the daughters. Regarding the, regarding the orders of inheritance, we need to be just and fair regarding their love, their affection, their attention, their importance. We need to be just and we need to be fair. Like Prophet Sallallahu has promised that when a father is put into trial by daughters, 
when a father is put into trial with daughters and he does not prefer sons over them and he loves them whom the daughters he loves them he takes care of their requirements and fulfills their necessities he educates them and he trains them and when they get old enough he marries them away then he will be like this with me and the transmitter says that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he showed he joined his index finger and his middle finger for people to understand how close this person who was being fair and who was being just in his love in his attention in his importance in his spending between the daughter and the son but here i would want to elaborate on one misunderstanding which is developing in the society of today the equality between the son and the daughter is being misunderstood to some extent justice or equality between the daughter and the son is not in that not in that form or in that extent that the daughter just comes up to any one of us saying that if the brother can stay out late till night why can't i and if the brother can ride a bike why can't i if the brother can wear a jean why can't i if my brother can go abroad studying all by himself why can't i if my brother doesn't cover his head why must i why must i cook clean wash in the house when he doesn't so this is not a form of equality they have both the son and the daughter they have both we need to tell them we need to educate them we need to train them that they are both physically emotionally socially integrally they have been created differently and they have different spheres of life they have different circles of their duties and responsibilities and this is what we need to teach our daughters before they leave our houses after getting before getting married we need to teach her all this and this is not against being just or being fair to them we will have to teach her and put in her mind all these concepts because then only will she submit to the obedience of her husband after marriage otherwise otherwise if she doesn't understand and comprehend this then the tendency the tendency of this irrational debate will continue throughout the life and this will definitely spoil her married life and her marital relationships so other than our sons and daughters we need to be fair in our dealings with our parents and our in-laws that is his parents and my parents we have to be fair we have to be very fair and just in our dealings in our mannerisms with his parents and my parents or with her parents and with my parents then we have to be fair in our dealings with the in-laws of our children like you must have experienced and you must have observed many times that when the in-laws of our daughter come to our house they are attended and they are served very lavishly but when the in-laws of our son the parents of our daughter in law they come in our house they are not served that lavishly and they are not given or extended the same extent and quality and quantity of our hospitality <coughs> remember and mark my words these behaviors don't go unnoticed they are felt they are very much felt and they are registered and these differences they hurt and in memories they stay behind as marks as marks which do not heal relations and bonds are effective 
they are affected because of these biased and unfair dealings. We need to be extremely fair and just and unbiased in all our dealings. Because Allah loves those who are fair and just in their dealings. And then other forms of justice within the house and within the family will be like what? We have to be just and we have to be fair in our dealings of our daughter and of our son-in-law. If the fault is with my daughter, I have to highlight it and I have to talk about it and I have to try and correct it. It won't be just my daughter right or wrong. No, this is not being just. This is not being fair. Similarly, I have to be just in dealings of my son and my daughter-in-law. If my son has wronged, then I have to accept it. I have to correct it. My son, right and wrong, is no policy of being fair or being just. And then I have to be fair in my dealings of my son and I have to be fair in expectations of my son and my son-in-law. If, my, if I want my son-in-law to respect me, to care for me, to visit me, then I, I don't have to get upset when my, when my son is seen doing the same to his mom-in-law. When I find my son visiting his mother-in-law, visiting or respecting or caring for his mother-in-law, I don't need to get upset about it. Because what I am getting, I should let him give also. I need to be fair. I need to be fair between my daughter and my daughter-in-law. If I want my daughter to come over to my house for the weekend, if I want my grandchildren to stay over the weekend, then I should not be unhappy when my daughter-in-law goes to visit her parents also. And then we need to be fair. We need to be fair in, in the dealings between our sisters and our brothers. Because you know what? We women folk, we women normally, we are inclined more towards our sisters. Socializing, talking, sharing, outing, all forms of these things. We are generally doing this between our sisters and leaving out our brothers. And sisters generally after getting married, all the siblings after getting married, Sisters generally tend to leave out the brothers only, only because he happens to be the husband of our somehow disliked sister-in-law. This is not being fair with your brother. This is not a fair dealing with your brother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all. Help us all be a practicing Muslim. We go through the message of Quran. We are attending the classes and sessions of the teachings of Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all practice all these teachings in our life. Help us, guide us to be just and fair in all our worldly dealings. Help us purify our intentions for all the deeds we do. For all the deeds, for all the activities we do in this worldly life, help us purify our intentions for hereafter. Help us, help us prepare for hereafter. Help us being worried about hereafter. Help us, help us keep Jannah as our aim, our target of our life and our final destination. رب اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين رب اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحبلنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب 
Before I wind up with my session of today, I would again, I would again request all of you to introduce these sessions of insight into the message of Surah An-Nisa to as many of those around you you can. This would be your just uh, a help you would be extending to all of us to help us spread the words of Quran and the message of Hadith and Sunnah. And then uh, obviously we are towards our winding up sessions. We might be just having like one or two other two or uh, most probably like three sessions of uh, this debate of Surah An-Nisa. But inshallah uh, telling all of you and informing all of you that after the month of Ramadan, we will be continuing these sessions we will be continuing these sessions of the commentary of uh, the verses and of the surahs of Quran, inshallah, on weekly basis. On weekly basis, will all these sessions be broadcasted uh, almost like one or uh, one and a quarter hour session every week, once a week. And uh, I would need a feedback from all of you whether you would want these sessions to be broadcasted live in the morning, like between between some time between like 11 to 1 session somewhere between 11 to 1 or would you prefer us broadcasting these sessions live between something between like 3 to 5 or 3 to 6 in different uh, uh, seasons according to the time of the sunset and according to the time of salah. So uh, we shall be continuing our discussions from the start of Quran now and we will be starting with uh, Surah Al-Fatiha and then in these weekly sessions I will continue with the discussion of Surah Al-Baqarah and we will be proceeding inshallah ta'ala uh, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will be continuing to cover all the Madni Surahs of Quran initially followed by the discussion of of the surahs which were revealed in the Makki period. So a uh, weekly session of our discussion and uh, almost the sessions will be like one to one and a half hour weekly. Help us all uh, propagate these sessions and introduce these sessions also to all those around you. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.